All right, we're going to try to cover quite a bit of ground this morning. Um, so we're going to start where we left off. Psalm 35. Jim, you want to pray for us before we get started? Yes. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the people that give us information from your book. Take it to your heart. Learn from it. Use it. Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. All right, so last week we talked about uh, Psalm 32, the repentant prayer, Psalm 33, the joy of forgiveness, and uh, about how God knows our detailed lives. And then Psalm 34, we talked about the angel of the Lord protecting us and how the Lord delivers us out of all of our, out of all of our trials. So. Um, here we have Psalm 35, we're continuing with a Psalm of David, and uh, we'll look at the outline here, if you don't have to, I'll get you one real quick. But this is a, a Psalm where he talks about, or how he asks God to contend with his enemies, and to fight his cause, or fight his battles. All right, so Psalm 35. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also, draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back who, and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly, and let his net that he has hidden catch himself. Into that very destruction let him fall. And this is him talking about himself. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All the bones shall say, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Fierce witnesses rise up and they ask things which I, that I do not know. That's a messianic, messianic verse. Uh, they reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I placed about, or I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. But in my adversity they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feasts, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. And I will give thanks to you in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink the eye who hate me without cause. For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful matters and against quiet ones in the land. Also, they open their mouth wide against me and say, Aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. Psalm 35, verse 22. This you have seen, O Lord, and do not keep silence. O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so we would have it. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, 
and my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Uh, just a few things to point out in Psalm 35. This is a plea where David is he's asking for God to fight his cause. He's asking for God to um, be against those who are against him. And God does fight our battles. We do pray for our enemies. We talk about that. And that's the commandment that we have is to love our enemies and pray for them. Um, but here he, he wants help and he knows that God can give it because God is just and he knows what's what the motive uh, may be for the people that are attacking him. Um, he talks about then verse 4 through 8 is a lot about what God's going to do to the wicked or people who resist God. And it doesn't look very good for them. They're like weeds. They're like chaff. That, uh, like Psalm 1 says, chaff that the wind drives away. And verses 9 through Pretty much the end of the song is more of a first-hand experience or uh, perspective. Verse 11, he says, Fierce witnesses have risen up or rise up, and they ask me things that I do not know. So when Jesus was interrogated, we studied that on the last couple of Wednesday nights in John chapter 18. He was like Isaiah 53 said he would be, and that is that he was like a sheep that opens not its mouth, led to the slaughter. And even though he was asked a lot of questions that were not fair, he didn't, he didn't let them delight in their evil schemes. He just told them what they had to know, or he didn't say anything at all. There's another gospel that says that he was taken before Herod, and he kind of wanted to parade him, and he had nothing to say for Herod. He never said a word to Herod. So that's an astonishing warning that when God has nothing to say to you, then that's pretty bleak, a uh, pretty dark place to be. So verse 11 is messianic. Verse 15 and 16, I think you could say, are uh, from the perspective of Jesus as well. And, and a lot of the Psalms, 73 of the 150 Psalms written by David, a lot of the Psalms indicate uh, this, this vindication or, or this plea or, you know, being misunderstood. A lot of times David was misunderstood, but more so Jesus was completely misunderstood uh, when he came, why he came, uh, what he came for. And so here in verse 15, they rejoiced. In my adversities and when Christ was being placed on the cross uh, he was they were gnashing their teeth at him uh, like there it says there in verse 16 uh, when Stephen was stoned it says they gnashed his, their teeth on him so the same way Jesus was was treated Stephen was treated um, so we're kind of looking at a few messianic verses in Psalm 35 verse 11 15 and 16 in Psalm 35 seem to point to Jesus uh, verse 21, they opened up their mouth against me and they said, aha, aha. But basically, they mocked Jesus and they said, if he was so great, if he could save others, you know, why doesn't he save himself? So David's, uh, David had some problems in his life, but he was hated by Saul. Before he ever did anything wrong, Saul hated him and plotted against him. After he had had the sin of Bathsheba, his own son, Absalom, plotted against him and hated him. So um, then... Because of his sin with Bathsheba, David, um, Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba, and she never, she, because he married her and everything that he did, Ahithophel never forgave David. And when Absalom was raising the power, rising to power, uh, Absalom went to Ahithophel and a couple other people and looked for advice, and Ahithophel um, told him how to ruin his father and that was to sleep with all of his virgins or with all his wives and on the tents and he did that and uh, Later David never went into any of those women again So he defiled his own father's bed and Ahithophel when he found out um, There was another time where Absalom could have destroyed David could have killed him and he went uh, Ahithophel told him you need to attack David. He's like a dog with his tail between his legs basically and there was uh, Hushai, I think it was, he gave advice, but Hushai was in cahoots with David and trying to protect David. But anyways, he gave the advice and said, no, your, your father David's a mighty man. When he's back into a corner, he'll destroy you. You need to get, you need to get your things in order. Well, David was, was in dire straits. And when Ahithophel found, he was an enemy, but he was a friend of David. Like they'd go to the temple together. They were friends, but once the sin of Bathsheba happened, he turned on him. Well, Hithophel, when he found out that Absalom didn't take his advice, he went home and hung himself. So 
Uh, we'll talk about that here in the next couple uh, songs, but David knew enemies. He had friends that became enemies. He had enemies who became friends to some degree. I mean, you look at Mephibosheth, the grandson of Saul, how nice he was, how kind he was to him. Um, but a lot of that's like Christ. Christ, when he came, um, I'm sure the Garden of Gethsemane, he may have even said some of these similar prayers that David did, we just read, longing for God to, um, to, to work in his affliction and to see him out for good, which he did. So Psalm 36, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, servant of the Lord. So we don't really know when this was written, what the context was, but we'll just go ahead and read. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes. When he finds out his iniquity and when he hates, the words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed and he sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor or hate or loathe or reject that which is evil. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep, O Lord, you preserve man and beast. Uh, there's a third day song that your love, O Lord, that uses those verses. Uh, how precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the, wicked, the workers of iniquity have fallen. They have been cast down and are not able to rise. Whenever I see a judgment in the Bible, I just put a big X out to the side. And whenever I see something that's pretty trepidatious or wicked or uh, you know unstable or awful, I'll kind of scribble line under it instead of a straight underline, just for me because I can see the contrast. And so many times, like Psalm 1 was the very first one where we're seeing the comparison between the righteous and the wicked, but he does a lot of that here. Um, he thinks about what God's going to do with the wicked. And, you know, we looked a few Psalms back and it says, meditate on the things of the Lord at nighttime. But the wicked, what they meditate on at nighttime is how to scheme, how to get rich quick, how to, how to hurt other people, how to trick, how to be a shyster, how to be, you know, tricky and, and sneaky. And uh, what's amazing, though, is like verse eight, they are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. And you give them the drink from the river of your pleasures for with you is a fountain of life. Your light, we see light. When, when we walk with Jesus, when we've asked him to come into our lives and we've asked him to come into our, um, just every area of our life and we just say, Holy Spirit, I want everything that you have for us. It's amazing because it's, he says, if anyone believes in me, a fountain of living waters will come forth from him. And whereas the wicked in the last psalm and in this psalm, all we have of reassurance for them is that they're like chaff and that they'll be judged and cast down, never to rise again. We've been told they're weeping and gnashing of teeth. We've been told that where the worm dieth not, there's not any satisfaction for those who reject him. And I think the judgment we don't, sometimes we may focus on passages we like in the Bible or in church on Sunday mornings, we don't talk about the judgment a lot, but the judgment's coming. And it does matter if you trust the Lord or if you don't. And here it is, he's just got a lot of insight. And if you, um, look at verse 4 where he says he divides wickedness he sets himself in a way that's not good and he doesn't hate evil Proverbs is very good at highlighting what wisdom truly is and wisdom and life come from uh, the wisdom that God desires is that we would love him and that we would hate evil because if you can't love God and hate evil or, or love evil and love God at the same time you can't hate God and, and uh it's just they're polar opposites. I can't be anxious and trust God at the same time. I can't, you know, serve God and money. I'll either hate one or love the other. And money can be the root of, the love of money can be a root of evil. Uh, pride can be a root of evil. Let not the foot of pride, verse 11, come against me and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. He's also praying that, that knowing if you're righteous because you trust in Jesus Christ, that we understand there are wicked people. We pray that they get saved. 
And while they're still in their rebellion, we can't, I don't have power to change someone, but still, Lord, protect me. Uh, what is the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer? He says, um, lead me not into temptation, deliver me from all evil. Jesus put that there as an example for us in the manner in which we should pray because it is important that we realize we gotta be, we got to be dependent upon him to avoid wicked people with wicked schemes and also know that God will deliver us. Uh, a couple of Psalms ago, it says the righteous fall seven times or yeah, verse 19 of Psalm 34 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He guards all of his bones, not let them be broken. So Christ fulfilled the, the, the bones part, but in the same way that God protected Christ, um, rose, the same power that rose him from the grave, we're not promised to not have suffering like Christ had. We will, but as long as we're here, we're not going to leave until God is done with us. And as long as we're here, God's going to protect you and guide your path. So I, I find great reassurance in that. Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Uh, verses 1 through 8, if you want to highlight or underline, there's so many good exhortations there. You can just underline, circle them. I, I try to circle all the, you know, trust, well, delight. Sorry, trust, well, feed, delight, commit. Um, trust, rest, do not fret. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, do not fret. So it says do not fret twice. It says trust a couple times. Uh, it says delight in there. Um, it says trust three times. Commit. Those are action verbs that we need to be possessing as Christians. We're born again. We're abiding in Christ. But if we don't keep doing these things, then the anxiety and the fret, it doesn't do us any good, but it can, it can derail us. It can discourage us. So really good passage there. We'll keep going. It's an, an amazing song. For evildoers, verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth for yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, Matthew 5, 5, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn their sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Just remember that verse. I have a big arrow pointed to it because if we're righteous and we trust in Jesus, Jesus Christ, and even if it's your last breath or even if you're the thief on the cross. That thief on the cross was richer than most, most people in the whole world, whether they have mansions, cars, trains, planes, whatever you want to say. Uh, you're rich because you have Jesus Christ. But even more than that, we have salvation, the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, love. Um, so it's much better than being rich but being wicked. Now you can be rich and righteous and that'd be cool. <laughs> keep, that, keep that going. I mean, we are relatively rich compared to the rest of the world. But if you can have Christ, godliness with contentment, that's the great game because you're a good steward of what he's given you. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken. Verse 17, we're in Psalm 37, Corey. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish once again, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. We got the lake of fire reference a little bit. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. We talked about it last week. We should be generous. 
if we're righteous with God, we're right with God, then we should give with an open hand, knowing that he's able to give us more, but because we love him. Verse 22, for those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. Verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. We reference that from Psalm uh, 34, 19. It says the same thing. Verse 25, I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Jim, have you ever seen a, a believer in Jesus Christ who loves the Lord begging for bread if they're willing to work? He always provides. He always provides. He always provides. Yep. And we need more of that in this country. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. Very good exhortation to a five to seven year old. Depart from evil, do good, and dwell forevermore. Uh, I meditated on that a few months ago, and yeah, I'm in the helping profession. I'm just like, just stop doing what's evil and do good. You'll be all right. That's my whole job in a nutshell, is that one verse. It's not rocket science, guys. You pay me a lot of money to tell you, stop doing what's wrong. But I think what, what breaks down in that verse is people don't reference what is evil because they think everything is relative. Mm -hmm. And then the, the culture wants to redefine what truth is and what's right and what's wrong. And that's where we get all money. So, woe to them who call good evil and evil good. Woe to them. Woe to our culture, the leaders of our culture. I'm just saying, uh, we can be salt. We can be light. We should be. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Once again, they're warning that they're going to have no, no future. The righteous shall inherit the land, the land and dwell in it forever. This has been like three or four times in the last couple of chapters. We're going to inherit the earth. We're going to inherit land. We're going to have a future and dwell in it forever. And it's not just for a little while, forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land again. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it again. The Holy Spirit is trying to tell us, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree, yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Again, indeed, I sought him, but, I, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. Again. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. So I counted several of them. I have one, two, three, four. I have at least four X's of judgment verses. But there's probably at least 10 or 12 judgment verses here in this one song. Verse 17, verse 20, uh, verse 38, 36. It just helps me to see the contrast, and that's Hebrew poetry for you. There's not a lot of rhyming, but there's a lot of, you know, this is what happens with the righteous. They inherit the land, live forever. This is what happens for the wicked. They will be snuffed out. They'll go where there's smoke and torment and not have nothing. They'll be, they'll be done away with. Um, not, I don't argue uh, annihilation, but I know they're going to, I believe, the lake of fire, that they'll be tormented, and it's, it's not good for them. But we will inherit the earth. We'll have heavens, new heavens and new earth. It's amazing. Uh, if you want to listen to some of Brenda's, Brenda's studies in Revelation and on heaven, uh, she ponders that. She's pondered that for over a whole year, every Sunday. So if you guys want to maybe get some of your questions answered on that, um, we have a lot to look forward to. And I think there's so many things we haven't even realized that await the righteous. But that's also more the reason that we should plant seeds and share the gospel with those that are in the, in the, dark, in the darkness and share the light. Whether it's neighbors, co-workers, uh, people you see on a regular basis, we should have compassion to spare them the destruction that they have coming if they, I don't want them to be cut off. And all the more, 
God desires that none should perish, but have everlasting life. The verse, uh, sorry, Psalm 38. Let's check that out. To bring to remembrance the Psalm of David. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure, for arrows, your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. Have you ever been really convicted by the Lord and He just makes your heart really heavy and you're, you know you're not right with Him? You know there's something that you need to get right with Him and He can pierce you like, like a, with His spiritual arrows. And those are bad arrows to be pierced with. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering and stink. Because of my foolishness, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are full of inflammation. There is no soundness in my flesh. Anybody ever been anxious for a little while? You're really stressed, really depressed, really angry. Something's going on in your life and you get intestinal issues. You ever notice that? Like you have, you just stomach aches, uh, you know, nauseous feeling. They, uh, he's just saying he's sick to his stomach. How, how bad he's messed up. Verse eight, I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before you, and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pants, my strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes, it has gone from me, also gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof or far away from my plague, and my relatives stand afar off. Those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those also who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. Uh, you remember Absalom, I told you a little bit about that story. He, he, uh, David, he, he was a, a fugitive. He's running for his life. Verse 13, but I am like a deaf man. I, like a deaf man, do not hear. I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. Uh, this is a messianic prophecy, verse 13, that Jesus would be like a lamb. He would not open his mouth when he was being tried. And... Christ fulfilled that as well. Thus I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth is no response. For in you, O Lord, I hope you will hear, O Lord my God. For I said, hear me, lest they rejoice over me. Lest when my foot slips, they exalt themselves against me. For I am ready to fall and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and they are strong. And those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those also who render evil for good, they are my adversaries because I follow what is good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Uh, we, we read in Psalm 22 the depiction. If you guys want to go back to it at your own time. Psalm 22 is from the perspective of Christ on the cross. But a lot of these portions could have been him during the trial and during the cross too. So it's amazing how the Holy Spirit gives us a little bit of insight as to the feelings that Christ was feeling. The experiences he was experiencing. And just to know, um, just to know that he, Jesus was brave. He was courageous. He had to go through all this emotional turmoil. And yet he stood victorious and he laid down his life. No one took it from him. Um, and, and he did pray to the Father as an example. And so uh, we do see him quoting some of the Psalms of David quite frequently. Uh, I think I can relate here to David too. And I think we all could when, when you're sick to your stomach with something that you've done. Uh, but to add insult to injury, he has here people scheming against him in the midst of his sin. It's complicated because now... People are scoffing at Christ or scoffing at God because of his account or they're just exchanging evil for good or good for evil, he says. So uh, enemies within, enemies within, enemies without. Uh, sometimes it's the world, but sometimes it's the flesh and uh, the devil. There's our three enemies. Let's look at Psalm 39. To the chief musician, uh, to Jeduthun, a Psalm of David. I don't know who Jaduthan is, but uh, a lot of and that does give me an opportunity to speak. A lot of these psalms, uh, 
were the equivalent of what we would have today. They were billboard chart hit kind of things, things that people would hear on a regular basis. If David wrote a song, it was to be played, and, and it played, probably played in, like we redo some songs with different styles. Uh, they had a, a set to the song of the, the Lilies, uh, the Sons of Korah. They just had, they had people, their, their only job was to write music for the temple. You have David, he wrote 73 of these songs. This is not all that he wrote. Um, you have uh, Solomon, he wrote hundreds of psalms, thousand, I think a thousand psalms. You think about, uh, it's good to have a melody in your heart unto the Lord. We talk about Ephesians 5.18, it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the word filled means be being filled, ongoing. And it says, uh, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit, ongoing, and greet each other with psalms and songs and spiritual uh, songs like hymns and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So even if you're not like the most musical person in the whole world, his desire is that through melody, through music, through his word and the poetic nature of his word, we are meditating on him throughout the day, throughout the week, ongoing. Like I said, the Psalm 1, he, he is like a tree planted on many waters because he, he delights in the law, he dwells and he meditates on the law day and night. And I think it's the musical element helps you with memory. It helps you with re re recollecting the fondness of how good he was in the past, uh, warning you, or uh, you can have a negative connotation. Some melodies could be uh, a warning for the wicked or a reminder for us of the judgment that's coming. So there are some songs that have that minor feel to them. But regardless, however the music ministers to your heart, I encourage you to grow in that area. As I've seen a season of refreshing with that with me, I would encourage you to uh, maybe revisit some of the old songs that encouraged you early on in your walk and uh, to continue to grow and make a melody to the, to the Lord in your heart. So to the chief musician, to Juduthan of Psalm of David, Psalm 39, I said, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. Uh, you ever around just unbelievers and you don't know if they're a Christian or not and you're just like, oh, I'm not going to say anything around this person or you know someone's kind of, they've uh, been tricky in the past. You're like, eh, okay. Anyway, verse two, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred up. There's times I'm like, man, why did I have witness to that person? But sometimes the Holy Spirit's like, eh, not yet or, you know. And as long as you're willing, I think God knows your heart. I know he does, but I think that that's what the key is. Where's your willingness? I was mute with silence. Verse 2, I held my peace even from good. My sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am? This is a wonderful perspective verse. And the entire Bible is probably one of the best verses. Psalm 39, 4. Make me to know my end and what are the measure of my days. Know how frail I am. Your life could be taken in an instant. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. And to know how frail we are, how, how uh, delicate we are in the hands of God. It puts an urgency in our life, but it also puts a peace knowing that he's protecting us. So I just encourage you guys to uh, meditate on that thought, if any, today. Um, knowing that you're in his hands. Indeed, verse five, you have made my days as handbreadths or inches, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. Think about that. How about, what do you think about that? Sila, that's what it means, just to ponder it. We're just passing through, Jesus said, you look at the lilies of the field, they don't clothe them, they don't toil, don't work, and they don't spin yarn, yet they're clothed, even greater than Solomon. So don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. That's what the heathen or the pagans or the Gentiles talk about, is what he says. But here he says, we're just a vapor. Uh, James talks about it. Don't, don't go and say, we got plans. You know, we're going to go to this place or that place, we're going to do this and that. He's like, you don't even know how long you're going to live. Your life is but a vapor. So he uses that same illustration. Surely every man, verse 6, walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain, or they make an uproar for nothing. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. 
And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. We talk about transgressions when you know where the line is and you willfully break that. You cross the line. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Remove your, and he's taught that could be about Bathsheba there. Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. Remember his son died. When, uh, with rebukes, you correct man for iniquity. You make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is a vapor. Think about that. Just that last context after verse 5, you know, 6 to 11, he's just talking about, uh, you've delivered me, but yet uh, it's awesome when God delivers you, but also he can, he can critique you and he can mold you and he can still sanctify you in the process. And it's painful a little bit, but he's just, he's ginger, you know, he helps us, we, you know, like as a parent, you don't want to squelch your kid, you don't want to douse them with so much water that as a flower they die, but you want to make sure you give them enough attention. And so we have a great God and we're, we're but a vapor. Our life is so short and we have all eternity ahead of us. Verse 12, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. Remove your gaze from me that I may regain strength before I go away and am no more. The sojourner thing and the strangers. I want to talk about that for just a minute. Abraham was a sojourner. He was a stranger. He was a pilgrim. He was looking for a, a land whose foundations were of God, whose builder and maker was God, not made with human hands. We're strangers and pilgrims. Hebrew talks about we're strangers and pilgrims in this world. Saint Peter, Peter talks about we're, we're pilgrims, we're strangers. And the strangers uh, of the dispersion. It's good to feel like a stranger in this world. It's good to know that we're just passing through. It's good to know that we're not alone because God is a stranger to the world. God uh, is estranged from the world, so to speak. And he was lonely when he came and took on flesh. Jesus was one of the most lonely men in the world. And when you're lonely, you're, you're identifying with him. So that's part of taking up our cross. And... There is some discouragement because David was only human, but you see by the Holy Spirit, verse 13, before I go away and I'm no more. We know when we die, our spirit leaves and we're going to be with the Lord. Um, he has us in his hands. Uh, we don't believe in annihilation. We don't believe that just, there's nothingness after this. So we believe you will, the soul will go somewhere. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of pleas here, a lot of comparison, contrast, uh, the wicked and the righteous. I hope that you've been able to take a few things out this week. And Psalm 37, like I said, verse 1 through 8, have tons of nuggets. Trust, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. It's like a life verse for me. Um, but I should encourage you guys to, to maybe underline, circle. When you see something that looks like judgment, put a little X or put something to, to remind you. These are warning. Like when you're talking with unsaved friends, hey, let me show you some things. Get in the habit of making a pattern with how you write your Bible. Um, but, and do by all means write in the Bible because this is, if we're a vapor, then what's this look? You know, it's, it's the word of God, but if you don't use the Bible, then it's not much use to us. We need to use the sword of the spirit and, and memorize it and meditate on it. So, um, let them put a new song in, in our mouths. Let them, let them be your hope this week. I uh, just want to pray for you guys and appreciate your prayers for this morning. Um, and just excited uh, if you could pray for the teaching ministry here too we would appreciate that um, just that we continue to to grow from from his word and that we get hungry in our own walk our own walk our own lives so father we thank you so much that you uh, you give us a reason to not be anxious you give us a hope that is secure lord we thank you that as we delight and take our refuge under the shadow of your wings. We delight in you. That you will fight our battles. We do pray for the wicked and the evil. And, the, and the, the, particularly our relatives. Um, our friends that need you. Our neighbors Lord that need you. They need you. They need to trust in you. And they need to accept you as their Lord. And as their Savior. 
We just pray for salvation for them. We pray that you give us opportunities to speak your word to them. And we pray that you would radically change their lives. We pray for revival in this town, in, in this church, in, the, in our sphere of influence. So we pray for salvation. So while there's still time, that we would work for the night is coming. There, and that you would use each of us as your, your mouthpiece. Use each of us as your hands and feet. Use us as vessels of your love, but also as vessels to warn the unruly, um, to warn the wicked that they, they don't have to perish, but they, can, they need to trust you soon. It's never too soon. Father, we just thank you for your word, and uh, we